Joan Stites is one of the great pioneers in the field of RNA biology. She started her RNA journey during a spectacular postdoc at the LMB, where she did some fundamentally important work on how ribosomes bind to messenger RNA to begin protein translation. After her move to Yale, her lab went on to discover spliceosomes, the particles that process pre-messenger RNA to generate mature mRNA. This work is not only important to basic biology, but underlined the importance of splicing in human disease. It has enabled the development of RNA-based therapeutics as a new class of treatment for certain diseases. In the course of her long and illustrious career, Joan has combined a dedication to doing the best, most rigorous science with a commitment to teaching and mentoring young scientists, particularly women. She has won many awards, has 11 honorary doctorates and has been elected to numerous learned societies, including the National Academy of Science in the US and the Royal Society in the UK. Joan, thank you very much for coming to talk to us today. I hope I got the number of doctorates right. Have there been more since um, Wikipedia last updated your entry? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Right. I, well, we'll I, stick. Don't, I don't regularly count them. <laughs> we'll stick with 11 then. Um, so can we start off by you telling me how you came to be at the LMB? Okay. So I was a graduate student with Jim Watson at Harvard. And by the time it was time to leave and go off and do a postdoc, I was married to my husband, Tom Stites, and he was a protein crystallographer. So there was only one place in the entire world that one would consider, namely the Mecca, which was the LMB lab, the MRC lab here in Cambridge. So we had to come here, and I understand what happened was that Jim Watson wrote a quick letter to Francis Crick and said, um, she's okay, she's coming. And Francis said, okay. And that was how I got to the LMB. Uh -huh. And one of the reasons that I'm wearing this, this pin that looks like a electron density spot on a, on a profile of a protein, um, X-ray analysis of a protein, is that my husband gave this to me, and every time I wear it, I think of the LMB and you know him as a protein crystallographer. Mm -hmm. So it has great sentimental value, and it's definitely linked yeah. to the LMB. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. <laughs> so you arrived here in November '67, I think. And That's true. What What were you like in those days? What were your expectations of your career oh, in science? Yes, okay. Well, my expectations of my career in science uh, was what led to my choice of projects and what I actually did here. Because when I arrived at the LMB, uh, and I went to talk to Francis, and Francis said, well, you know, we haven't really decided on who you should work for, or where you should would have space. Why don't you go do a project in the library? And I knew that um, experimental work, not uh, theoretical work, was my forte. Mm. And therefore, what I did was to go around and talk to everybody available, which meant mostly my uh, male peers, all the American postdocs, of which there were about a dozen in the lab at the time, were all men. And I went around and talked to them and a few of the staff members as to what sort of project I might have and who I might sort of align myself with in terms of the, the sort of division of the, the lab by staff. And uh, there was a one project that was wonderfully exciting, very, very challenging, but so challenging that none of the men had dared take it on because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to get results in two years, which was then the usual postdoc stint in order to go back to the States and get a job. Mm -hmm. And I found it very exciting, and I said, well, why don't I do this? Because I had zero expectations. I'd never seen a woman science professor or a woman head of lab before that, although I had worked in labs for three or four years, even, no, even more than that, five or six years. Um, I had no expectations of ever looking for a faculty job, so I said, why don't I try this project? Mm -hmm. 
And that was the project that worked and set my career. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it sounds like you must have been fairly confident to be able to just wander about talking to people and then decide what you were going to do. Well, I wasn't being pushed in any other direction. And I did, you know, get support from the people that I talked to, both in terms of my postdoc peers, all the male Americans, mm -hmm. and um, as well as, you know, members of the staff on the, on the second floor of the old LMB. Mm -hmm. So was that the way projects were decided in those days, that people just had a chat and saw what was going? Or? I don't know whether that's the way other people's projects were decided, but that's the way mine was decided. And then uh, Mark Brecher was kind enough to give me about this much bench space. Mm -hmm. And besides, he had expertise in the initiation of protein synthesis that was needed for the project. I had expertise in that I knew how to grow P32 labeled phage mm -hmm. and the idea was to use those p32 labeled messenger rnas to make initiation complexes trim the ends and then use the new techniques that were being developed in fred sanger's lab to sequence the pieces that were protected mm -hmm. by the initiating ribosomes and that's what eventually worked so were you bringing in that technique uh, as a new thing to the LMB? Well, nobody had done this experiment right. before at the LMB, although there was one publication in the literature that said that ribosomes will protect a particular length, about 30 nucleotides of a messenger RNA. Mm -hmm. um, so it was the idea of having uh, that done under, under conditions of the initiation but no elongation of protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, using Fred's technology, yeah. which was just being developed, to actually get the sequence of the pieces that were protected. Mm -hmm. so and the step in between was that you had to be able to fractionate the protected pieces from all the other stuff, of which there was lots more, right? Lots and lots of degraded P32 labeled RNA. Mm -hmm. And um, that was what hung me up for about a year hmm. until um, I almost gave up the project, but had a talk with Sidney Brenner, yeah. who then said, hmm, he said, you know, sometimes experiments are like a bad marriage. You have to give them one more try before you give them up for good. <laughs> and I gave it one more try and switched my technology. I was trying to use uh, sizing columns to fractionate the bound bits from the, all the other stuff that was mm -hmm. degraded. And that was hopeless because it was involved too much volume and things stuck to things and the fraction collector stuck in the middle of the night and put it all over the floor. Uh, and I switched to su sucrose gradients and that worked perfectly. And then it was off and going. So how much P32 are you having to use for these experiments? Well, back in those days, it wasn't all that much. Mm. A couple of millicuries. Wow. That's quite a lot by... It's quite a lot. <laughs> it's standards. quite a lot by today's standards. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but, so, but again, by industrial standards, it's not a lot. It yeah. wasn't a lot even then. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So what, what was day-to-day -day life like in the lab in those days? Well, one would come in in the middle of the morning and uh, Saturdays in particular, there would be coffee with Sydney. And uh, you know, Sydney would just go on and on and on, terribly amusing, and talk about things. And everybody would gather to gain his wisdom. <laughs> um, and you'd do your experiments, and you'd go for morning coffee to the canteen, and then you'd go for lunch to the canteen, and then you'd go to afternoon tea to the canteen and have interactions with people. And um, was it very different from what you'd known before in Harvard? Oh, oh yes, because at Harvard it was very much one lab. Well, it was a big lab because it was the Watson Group and the Gilbert Group, and the Gilbert Group was growing at that time. Mm -hmm. And then it became also a third lab, the Weber Group. But, um, but it was much more sort of isolated although Jim did bring in all sorts of people from all sorts of places, but that was unique. What was different here was that everybody was talking to everybody all the time, mm -hmm. no matter what they were doing or which floor they were from. 
and it was just an incredibly stimulating scientific environment. Mm. Nice. And Max would come over with his stool and his banana, I'm sure, and a piece of cheese. I'm sure you've heard about this, and say, you know, can I, can I join you for lunch? And Max Fruits would sit down and you'd have a conversation with him. Was that intimidating? Uh, after a while, not all that intimidating. He was very modest about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Huh. So he wasn't um, as famous then as he was later. I guess not. Yeah, yeah. that probably helped. <laughs> and and your your time here kind of coincided with the start of the women's movement and yeah. lots of stuff going on in the nineteen sixties. So did that yeah. make it, did that percolate into the lab? Into the lab here. Okay. So I was the only woman in the division of cell biology or whatever it was called at that point, the mm -hmm. second floor, um, in terms of a trainee. Pippa Merrick sort of showed up during the end of the time I was here as a research student. And um, then um, Sue, why am I going to remember? She was on the third floor. She's coming. Suzanne Corey. No, no, not Suzanne. Well, Suzanne. Oh, Susan yeah, Susan, Taylor. Yeah, both Susan both of them both of them came um, after after I was here, mm -hmm. but there were very 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 few women. And uh, so, and did you did you actually notice that you were female? If you oh, see yeah, what I mean? Of course. Of it, course. You didn't yeah. you didn't and just I, feel again, like a scientist. <laughs> you were. No, no, no. I felt like a female scientist, and I expected that my career would be to be a research associate in somebody else's lab, who would, of course, be a man, mm -hmm. and that I would, you know, maybe I'd have a graduate student sort of assigned to me or something like that, and I would do research, which I love doing, and that would be my, my future career. So the possibility of status and all that sort of thing yeah. In, yeah. in line with your talents it well, didn't bother I didn't you know that, that I had any talents at that point. Well, you must have known a bit. I mean, you'd done well, a fairly decent PhD in Jim Watson's lab, exactly, and then you did something amazing exactly, here. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that that helped. Yeah. And also, what was happening? Okay, so after there was a lot of upcry about women representatives in general in higher education in the late 1960s. I mean, basically, it was leftovers from the nepotism rules that universities had stemming from the Depression and World War II, when it was, you know, really felt unfair that more than one person in a family should have a, a paying job. Oh, really? Yeah, huh. yeah, that was very much the, the idea, and I think a lot of the source of it. And even though in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 there was an Equal Opportunities Clause, that didn't get enacted until the early 1970s. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a man named George Schultz, who was the Health Education Welfare, or whatever it was called, secretary under Nixon, who for some reason decided to write to universities, and he supposedly wrote them a letter that said, if you don't have plans for hiring women faculty, you might lose your federal grants. And everybody went, ah, of course. Yeah. And um, that was when um, more women started being hired. Now, this was after I was hired in 1970, so this happened within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And for years, I doubted that that letter actually existed. But like 10 years ago, I met at UCSF a secretary who had been secretary to the chair back then. And she said, yes, I saw that letter. Mm -hmm. And that was part of what got Christine Guthrie hired uh -huh. to a faculty position at UCSF, where she had come to interview for a research position. Oh, wow. Huh. So, so there, was a big, there was a big increase in the early 1970s, mm -hmm. and suddenly there were other women at other universities in, in faculty positions. Mm -hmm. But there was, did that sort of thinking start to happen while you were here though was that something that occurred to you i mean it must no, have done I because mean, people were very nice to me and i felt like i was respected and so uh but you know it was a different country so i didn't really know what was going on back home and i knew that we expected to go back mm. so 
I just want to talk about your social life here, oh. um, which I think brings us on to this, this lovely photograph. Yes. So this is... Would you want to yes, 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 yes. Tell me what it's... Who, who those are and... Well, yes. <laughs> I'm the tallest one because I'm standing up Perhaps and then my husband's really behind me. Perhaps. Okay, yeah, there we go. Uh, that's me and my husband Tom and Suzanne Corey and Jerry Adams. Now, Jerry Adams I had known because he was a graduate student in the Watson lab, mm -hmm. I think a year ahead of me. And so he had come here to study protein synthesis with, um, It was for, in the Fred Sanger's division, mm -hmm. but I've forgotten exactly whom he was assigned to work with. Mm -hmm. And Suzanne had come here to do her PhD and ended up with, with Brian Clark uh -huh. uh, supervising. She sequenced a tRNA. Um, and we got to, well, Tom, Tom and Jerry had known each other from Harvard and we got to be good friends with them. And as a result, we have friends in Australia that we have visited over the years yeah. and they visited us. And I mean, that was one of the most wonderful things about the LMP was the friendships that we made that have been lifelong friendships. Mm -hmm. We've gotten together in pleasant surroundings as in the Swiss mountains mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years with the people that, yeah. yeah. So th were the foreign postdocs a sort of distinct group at the lab? Yes, I, yes. I, would, I would say so, although they didn't exclude mm. English members of the staff. There were several members of the staff that did interact with the, quote, American postdocs, because that's almost who they all were mm. uh, at that time. Mark Bretcher was one of them, and Brian Clark, and John Smith, and yeah. Mm. And then there were some others that interacted less. Was it considered unusual to go abroad for a postdoc when you came? Oh, no, it was very much the thing to mm. do. Um, and it's gotten to be less of the thing to do. Mm. As, uh, but for molecular biology and particularly for structural biology, I mean, this was the mecca yeah. in the yeah. world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Very, very fortunate to have come here. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can flip it around and say they were fortunate to have got you, actually. But anyway, but you, I just want to go back to your, your project, which... So your project worked incredibly well, eventually. Uh, yes, yes. Did that change the way you perceived yourself? Well, I think it had to in a certain sense. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I perceived myself as somebody who could do something... Um, when we came back to the, the U.S., my husband had already set up a job at, at Berkeley in advance. And at Berkeley, they told uh, <clears throat> my husband, oh, well, doesn't your wife want to be a research associate? Our, our lives are all research associates in our labs, and they love it. And at that point, we had already garnered a couple other offers of faculty positions mm -hmm. uh, for both of us at and we decided to, to go to Yale and leave Berkeley. Yeah, <laughs> that seems reasonable. Yeah. And did it, so did it change the way people here thought about perceived you as, as well as... You mean at the LMB? Yeah. Well, I think it must have. I mean, you know, people's impressions of other people change as people grow and mature and contribute. Uh, yeah, so I was, I was always uh, astonished and happy if... I happened to be at some international meeting and Sidney were there and he'd come talk to me Yeah. because mm -hmm. it didn't seem like he would necessarily have to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So very flattering. Yeah. And I gather you were the first woman ever to give an internal lab talk here. The, the, um, really? the October talks, yeah, you know, really? the annual, the annual lab talks. Okay. You were the first yeah. ever. Leslie Barnett never did. No, no, you were, you were the first one in 1969. So. Well, I had something exciting to talk about. Yeah. 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 I was nervous. I bet. Yeah. 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 Huh. So it was clear to everybody here that you'd done something fairly impressive then. I think so. Yeah. 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 As it was to, you know, many people in the States, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something that Elizabeth Blackburn, I think, said to me a while back, that, that she, she always wondered whether 
the women who came here would have done well anywhere or whether it was something about the LMB that, that well, changed Well, I don't think them. it was something about the LMB that made them. I mean, I think they came with innate capabilities, but certainly being here enhanced those capabilities yeah. and enhanced the contacts. And so much of science is about thinking about making connections that you wouldn't normally make or thinking about things slightly differently. And here you had the wonderful exposure to structural biology as well as to the developing molecular genetics. And it was just such an incredibly rich environment. Mm -hmm. It was what a privilege. Yeah. So you were here two years or three, three years? Three, three years. years. Yeah, because we went to Berkeley and tried to figure out what they were going to do with me. And then when they <laughs> said what should happen to me, we came back here for another couple of months and then went to Yale. Yeah. And what was it like starting your own lab after having been a postdoc here? Oh, well, as hard as it ever is. I mean, it, it's still hard. Starting so you must have lab. been one of the first women, women faculty in, in the well, States. Well, no, but that's, I wasn't the first, even the first woman in my department because um, the department that I'm in at Yale was formed in 1968 by a merger and I think this is with King, Kingman Brewster was advising Fred Richards, who was the first chair. Um, or sorry, Sidney Brenner was advising Kingman Brewster. And I think what happened was that Sidney had made some suggestion to Brewster about this particular arrangement that Fred then took over as chair because it was a combination of the old biochemistry department in the medical school with the biophysics department that was part of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And for many years, it was uniquely the only department at Yale that was both medical school and Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And that was its strength, was combining mm. the, two, the two ends. And um, so what was your question? How different it was in Yale compared to here, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, so, so in a sense, um, Yale was sort of, in a sense, trying to mimic, and under Fred Richards' uh, leadership, he was fabulous, yeah. uh, did very well at mimicking the type of environment yeah. that, that we had had here. Mm -hmm. And I think you've talked in the past about stereotype threat. Yes. Can you I tell have. me a bit about that? Well, that... that Okay, what stereotype threat is, is a set of reactions, psychological, physiological reactions, that any person is prone to if they feel that they are part of an undervalued minority. So obviously women in science for many, many years, and I think it's still the case, are an undervalued minority. And what happens if you're you know, trying to carry out your daily work and you're beset with this, this frame of mind is that you undergo these various symptoms which have to do with things like, you know, your blood pressure goes up and your pulse rate goes up when you're asked a question or if you're expected to do something, you have doubts about whether you can do it or not. And that's the whole phenomenon that's been described as stereotype threat. And I certainly had that. And I had that for many years and only realized it when I found out that this was a described phenomenon in 2007 mm -hmm. from the cognitive psychologists. And I think it isn't something that you can sort of, you know, go out and cure. Mm -hmm. But understanding that the reason that you're reacting the way you're reacting to particular situations where you're the only woman in the room mm. helps you get through those situations in a way that if you don't understand what's going on is much, much harder. Mm. Mm. So that's why I try to talk about this, especially with young women scientists, mm. because I think it's, it's, it's pervasive and it doesn't just apply to women scientists, it applies to other minority science yeah. scientists if one asks, asks around and talks to people about it. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't help anybody. So you felt insecure and frightened yeah. for a lot of your career. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But you yeah. just did it anyway. 
Yeah, well, I did the part that I knew I could do well, which is, uh, you know, for, in the first place, doing the research, and in the second place, directing the research with wonderful younger colleagues who, you know, when I discovered that it's almost as much fun to uh, share the joy of discovery with a younger colleague as it is to make the discovery oneself. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's driven my career. Huh. So are there moments at the LMB that particularly stand out for you still? Um, moments having to do with science. Well, moments, mean, yes, but moments to do with your life. Oh, yeah, my life, in general. yes. Well, the, the one thing that hasn't come up is that one day after we'd been here about a year, year and a half, Mark Bircher said, came up to me and said, how would you like to participate in an experiment? <laughs> And I said, sure. And he said, he was a, a research fellow at Keyes College. And he said, I'd like you to put you up for member of the room, which means that you get to go along and have drinks before high table once a week with the other fellows. Now, of course, there were no women fellows mm -hmm. at all. And he said, the argument that I'm gonna make is that, uh, we can make history by being the first college to appoint a female member of the room, but you're gonna leave and everybody knows that. So it's not a long-term thing that everybody's gonna have to put up with. <laughs> so in fact, I was elected the first member of the room at Gonville and Keys College, huh. which was uh, interesting. And how was dinner at Keys in those days? At Keys. <laughs> okay, so the master was, um, Joseph Needham, mm -hmm. who was a sort of... He was a biochemist slash sinologist. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so he was a sort of biochemical embryologist, apparently, but he was really famous, as you mentioned, for his studies. He got involved with Chinese scientists for, for his studies of Chinese culture and science. And... It, it was still a little daunting. It used to take me a day to work up courage to call the head butler and say, I want to come in to dine. <laughs> did but re Did they regard you as an interesting foreign curiosity then? Or? I mean, they, they were just pretty normal. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it, was, it was okay. Mm. But it was, it, it was still difficult. Talk about stereotype threat suffering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, <laughs> yes. But then, uh, you know, my husband would go along to, he was a tennis player, mm -hmm. and he would go along to the Keys tennis courts and say, I'm Dr. Stites, I'd like a, a, a court, a court, mm -hmm. right. And they'd say, hmm, oh yes, Dr. Stites, uh, you're assigned that, <laughs> that court. Oh, I'm glad it came in useful at least. Yeah, so it came in very <laughs> useful for it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to end by asking you a question you must have had millions of times before, which is, what advice have you got for young women scientists what today? What advice have I got? <sighs> it seems to me, I, yes, I have been asked that many times. And, um, okay. Know about stereotype threat, because that has to be part of what uh, you're experiencing. And um, if you really love science and want to do it, you'll be able to do it in some appropriate type of position. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's going to be hard work. I mean, choosing the right partner is very, very important. You have to find somebody who's going to share the responsibilities and understand what the challenges are for you. And I was, again, very, very fortunate in that way. My husband was wonderful. Um, and, you know, if you, if you love science, uh, go for it and keep your eyes open and your ears open for these peripheral connections, which are the things that make you sort of leap, in, leap ahead and perhaps into other fields that you might not have gotten yourself into mm -hmm. if you were very, very focused on one particular thing. Uh -huh. Joan, thank you so much for coming along today.